Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, as we continue our study in the book of Hebrews, we consider the greatness of Christ Jesus. If you're not a, if you're not a note taker this morning, I, this is a good day to start taking notes. Okay, I'm just saying, I'm just going to suggest, I, when I'm listening to sermons, I'm not always a note taker, uh, right? Um, but... This would be a good time to, to take notes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a lot of verses, internal verses from the book of Hebrews um, this morning as we study uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, let, let me just catch you up real quick. We began Hebrews 1 uh, several weeks back. I, it took me three weeks to preach the first three and a half verses of Hebrews. But then I picked up the pace last week, amen? Uh, and so uh, it's all good. We, we, we're just waiting on the Lord, right? And so we got nowhere to be. Um, just waiting on the Lord so we can take our time through the study. Uh, long ago... Chapter 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, Jesus, the son, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. And he, Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So, so here we go. There, verse 4 is the transition, right? It is, it is the transitional verse of, of Hebrews 1. He, the, the writer of Hebrews is transitioning. He's going to prove to his readers that Jesus the Christ is better than the angels. Now, the angels were the mediator of the Old Covenant. That is the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law was, was delivered through angel, angels. Uh, Acts, uh, the sermon of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, Stephen references that truth. And in Galatians chapter 3, the apostle Paul references that truth. That, that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament law was delivered to Moses by the angels. Somehow angels were, were involved in mediating the Old, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant law. So, so now, the book of Hebrews is presenting Jesus as superior, as greater than, right? Consider his greatness. Jesus is greater than the angels. We pick it up in verse 5. How, how is Jesus superior to the angels? Verse 5, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, so, so there's this, contrasting, go, this contrast going on, comparison between the sun and the angels. These are all old, this is seven Old Testament quotations, verse 8. But of the Son, the Father says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your, compa beyond your companions. And, verse 10, you, you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has God the Father ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Now our text for today, therefore. Here's the application. Uh, interesting, the, the application, if you look at Hebrews chapter 1 and 2 as a sermon, uh, the application's in the middle, right? Um, 
a little bit, of, a little bit different, not how I was taught to do sermon work, but, but that's okay. This is, this is God, this is the Holy Spirit, right? right? This is the Holy Spirit. Who, who's the author of Hebrews? The Holy Spirit, right? Uh, Pastor Jason and I came to that agreement uh, over the week. He, he, he kept saying, what, where's Jay? He's probably not in here, Barnabas. He kept saying, Bar- uh, it's Barnabas, it's Barnabas. He's joking, but I'm like, why don't we just agree it was the Holy Spirit, right? Therefore, verse 1, chapter 2, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So so the overall theme of the, the letter of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ, the superiority of the new covenant, grace, over the old covenant, law. Uh, the superiority of grace over law. Law, the, the law of God exposes us as sinners. Uh, the, the law of God confirms that you and I are guilty before a holy and righteous God. The law of God condemns us to death. Right, right under the law, there is condemnation for every sinner under the law. If, if we die, if we were to die under the covenant of law, we would be condemned to death, but not under grace. Uh, the grace of God frees us from the condemnation of our sin. Grace, the, the law exposes, the law confirms our guilt, the law condemns us to death. Grace redeems us from our sin. Grace removes our guilt and shame. Grace frees us from condemnation. If you, if you try, if you set out this morning to plumb the depths of your personal sin against God, the grace of God through Jesus will run deeper than you can plumb. Listen, if you stretch your sins against God from east to west, the grace of God through Christ Jesus will remove your sins as far as the east is from the west, right? If you you try to pile your sins against God all the way high and your sins reach into the heavens, let me tell you, friends, the grace of God will reach higher, right? Grace, the grace of the Lord removes our guilt. It removes our shame. It frees us from condemnation. Hebrews Hebrews is a book of theological depth in that it challenges us today, those of us here today, to know our Old Testament, how, how well do you know the Old Testament? How well do you, do you see, can you trace God's plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation? So I, w- I would encourage you, if you couldn't do that, if you can't do that, to set out on that journey. Uh, Hebrews will help us on that journey. Uh, because there is a lot of Old Testament depth here in the book of Hebrews. You will, chal- you will be challenged uh, during our study of Hebrews to think more deeply about the Old Testament and the deep things of God, namely his plan of redemption. Now, now you might reject the challenge, but you will be challenged, right? You, you, you may show up every Sunday that, that we're preaching and studying through Hebrews and, and, and the challenge is there and you may reject it, but, but the challenge remains nonetheless. So, so let me give you, let me give you these, uh, these themes, if you will, of the book of Hebrews. Number one, these are in your notes. Hebrews is a book that calls us to consider. Hebrews calls us to consider. Consider Jesus. Hebrews 3, verse, verse 1, and I'm just going to read these texts really quickly. Don't, don't try to keep up with me and turn, by turning there. I put the references in your notes. Uh, Hebrews 3, 1, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Hebrews 12, three, consider him 
who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Why? Why should we consider Jesus so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted? Like, where does our stamina come from in a, in a world filled with wickedness and sin? Our stamina comes from considering Jesus. Ponder him. Meditate upon him. Pause every day and consider Christ. Uh, consider your brothers and sisters. Consider your brothers and sisters. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Consider your brothers and sisters. Uh, consider your spiritual leaders, Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Uh, consider the outcome of their way of life. Oh, there, so, so it's scriptural to consider the outcome of your spiritual leader's way of life. <laughs> I don't know if you can see my facial expression, but, but there it is. It's in scripture, right? Consider the outcome of your pastor's life and imitate their faith. Don't, don't imitate their doubt, imitate their faith, right? right? And so far as your pastors walk with the Lord, imitate them. Well, where your pastors may veer off from the Lord, then, then you keep following Jesus, right? You just keep going after Christ. Consider yourself, Hebrews 3.12. Consider yourself. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Consider yourself. Consider your own heart. Uh, uh, Hebrews is a book calling us to consider. Hebrews is a, a book of confident assurance of faith, not doubt. A lot, of, a lot of people, if you read commentaries on the book of Hebrews, you will inevitably run into commentators who, who, who believe that Hebrews is not a book of assurance and maybe casting doubt. Hebrews is a book of confident assurance. Consider some of these verses. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 6.11, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness. Why? To have the full assurance of hope until the end. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 3.14, for, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. This confident assurance, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, be assured that you are in Christ. Anchor your heart to him and keep going for the Lord. Hebrews 4.16, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Hebrews 6.19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Right? Hebrews is a, a book of exhortation. Hebrews is a book of exhortation. There are five warning passages in Hebrews. I've listed them there in your notes. Hebrews 2, 3, 5, 10, and 12. These are, these are five warning passages. All five of them are exhortations for these genuine believers to grow forward in their spiritual walk with Christ. So, so Hebrews, Hebrews is a book written for believers. This is a letter written to genuine believers. So, so I'm, I'm saying this and I'm emphasizing this because commentators are all over the map on this. If you do a serious study of the book of Hebrews and you, you reference commentaries, you will, you will find a vast array of interpretations of these five passages, warning passages, exhortation passages. Okay, so, so I'm emphasizing to you this morning that the, that the book of Hebrews was written to believers uh, because I hope to thoroughly convince you that these passages, these five warning passages, do not teach that true believers can lose their salvation. Because some people take these warning passages and they, they try to turn them and teach that, that a believer can lose their salvation. I believe that these are exhortations to grow forward spiritually in Christ. So, so these believers, these believers that, that are receiving this letter, that initially received it, they are primarily passive in their faith. 
Okay? They're, they're passive in their faith. They're, they are persecuted, yes. They are, they are not ready to stand in the midst of persecution. They are saved, but they are not maturing in their faith. Uh, turn over to Hebrews 5, and I'll just give you this one proof text to just draw out. The writer of Hebrews in, in chapter 5 comes to verse 11, which is the third, this is the third warning passage in the book of Hebrews. He, he says there in verse 11, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Not, not leave it as forget it, but build upon it. Let, let's build on the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. So, so that passage tells us something about the original recipients of this letter. That, that they were not maturing in their Christian faith. They were not growing forward. They were complacent. They were apathetic in the things of the gospel. Which is important as we enter into the first warning passage this morning. So here is the first exhortation. Verses, two through, verses 1 through 4 of chapter two. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. So, so here, here's kind of the theme statement of, of today's message. If we neglect our salvation, we will suffer loss, right? If we neglect our salvation, we will suffer loss. The question is, what, will we, what loss will we suffer? Right? If you and I neglect our salvation, if we neglect the grace of God, if we take the grace of God for granted and we don't grow forward in our faith, we will suffer loss as believers. So, so just remember that the argument here is from the lesser to the greater. Right? Uh, from, from a lesser mediator, the angels, to a greater mediator, Jesus, from a lesser covenant law to a greater covenant grace, from a lesser responsibility, obedience to the law from religious legalistic duty, to a greater responsibility, obedience born out of heartfelt loving faith, right? Uh, so this is the difference between, between legalism and righteousness under grace, right? Legalism says I've got to do this I have to do this in order to appease God, in order to make God happy with me. No, grace says, grace says, I love the Lord, therefore I long to serve him because the spirit of God is working in my heart. He's changed, he's changed the motivation of my heart to be love for the Lord. So, so here's the exhortation. Very simply in verse one, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Church, we must pay closer attention, right? But, but to what? What, what? what must we pay closer attention to? Well, we have to go back to, to Hebrews 1, 1, and 2, right? Now, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Uh, what must we pay closer attention to? The, the revelation that the Son has brought to us, that this greater revelation that is namely the gospel. We must pay closer attention to the gospel. Just maybe, maybe in your Bible, if you mark in your Bible, maybe underline the word must, right? Must. There, there is a divine necessity laid upon those who have heard and believed the gospel. There is, a, there is a weight of necessity upon us today, those of us who have believed the gospel, and the weight of the necessity is pay attention, pay close attention. Pay close attention to the grace that's been given to you in Christ Jesus. Pay attention to it. It matters what attention we give to it. In the context of the original recipients of this letter, 
As I said, they were living in some measure of spiritual complacency towards the gospel. They were treating the gospel casually, it appears. Uh, they They were treating their spiritual life casually. It's not that they had paid no attention to the gospel, but, but they, they, they needed to pay closer attention to it. They needed to be much more excessive in giving their attention to the good news that Jesus saves. Uh, friends, I enjoy baseball. I enjoy baseball. I, I enjoy watching a baseball game, but oftentimes when I put a ball game on, I'm doing other things. I'm not paying close attention. I'm not looking at every pitch. I'm not, I'm not analyzing. I'm not, let, not, not analyzing what pitch is coming next. Sometimes I do that kind of thing in my mind or sit there. Baseball is a game of strategy, right? But a lot of times baseball, the baseball game's on and, and I, might be, I might be on my iPad or phone. I might be reading a book. I might be talking to my wife or my kids, right? These believers were not paying attention to their to the gospel message, to their salvation. They were not growing forward in their faith. This entire exhortation, pay much closer attention, means to be alert for. Watch out, be on guard, beware, consider carefully, continue to believe, hold on more tightly, right? Are, are, you, are you on high alert Regarding the gospel and the gospel's work in your soul, in your life, are you carefully considering your manner of life as a gospel believer? Are you holding tightly to the gospel? The implication is that there is a spiritual danger for us. There's a spiritual danger for us, which leads us to the reason for the exhortation, verses two and three, right? It's point number two, the reason for the exhortation. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So so I want to just give you a series of questions here under this point. Number one, why must we pay closer attention to the gospel? The spiritual danger is revealed in the last half of verse 1. The danger for these Hebrew Christians is the same danger we face today. It's the danger of drifting. It's the danger of drifting away from Christ, the danger of drifting away from the grace of Christ. The the word drift is a nautical term that speaks of a ship or a boat that has lost its moorings to its source of safety and rescue. Like Jesus is our source of salvation and to drift from him is to drift away from our moorings. It has been suggested that the Greek word indicates the fastening of the anchor to the seabed to keep the ship from drifting. Right, so so we go back to some of our references before. Uh, Hebrews 3, 6 is one I didn't share before, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that endures. Right? Or the, the writer of Hebrews senses the danger of his readers drifting away from Christ. The, the rope that bound their heart to Christ was loosening There was too much slack and they were drifting out into the dangerous waters of the sea, into the world. The further the believer drifts away from Christ and the graces of Christ, the greater the danger of becoming shipwrecked in this world. Do you sense that danger in your own heart and life? The danger of drifting out into the dangerous waters of this world. Friends, faith is the anchor that binds us to the object of our faith. And who is the object of our faith? Jesus is. Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. Faith, your faith does not save you. Does that surprise you? Your faith doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. It's the object of our faith that saves us. Or who saves us? Right? But our faith, is, our faith is the lifeline to the object, right? We must come believing. We must come believing that God is good. 
and that Christ is the answer. So to strengthen the rope of your faith that binds you to Jesus, we, we must pay closer attention to the gospel. Please don't underestimate the power of the pull that this world has. Like we come in here on Sunday mornings, and, but we have been out in the world for six days. We've been out in the world for six days and, and the world has gotten onto us and the world has sought to get into us. And, and there is a danger if we are not anchoring our soul to Jesus Christ Monday through Saturday, there is a danger that we would drift away from him. So, so what are the graces that would pull the rope tight? Well, what's the word of God? It's the word of God. It's prayer. It's the fellowship and the community of believers. It's the day-by-day community that you and I experience as we walk together Monday through Saturday, encouraging one another, praising the Lord together, thanking the Lord together, rehearsing for one another what God is teaching us. Like, I hope you have people in your life, in your sphere of influence. If you're married, maybe it's your spouse. I hope as, as husbands and wives we can do that sort of thing. Encourage one another in the word. But don't underestimate the power of the pull that this world has. So here's, here's the second question that comes under this point. What does the covenant of law have to do with the covenant of grace? So I ask this question because of verse 2. Because he says, since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Hey, he's talking about the law. And then he draws his comparison to verse 3 by asking the question, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The great salvation is the new covenant, the covenant of grace, delivered by Christ, right? So, so what does the law have to do with the covenant of grace? Well, well remember, it's, it's, the argument is from lesser to greater, right? The covenant of law is the lesser covenant as compared to that of the covenant of grace through Jesus Christ, so, so the forgiveness of sins through Christ. So, so the law, the law has proven reliable, he says in verse 2. How is the law proven reliable? Well, well, it has exposed every transgression. It has exposed every disobedience. And it has brought justice and judgment. There, there will be a full retribution under the law. For those who die under the law, there will be a full retribution. There will be justice. Oh, friends, we need mercy. We need mercy. We need grace. We need the grace of the new covenant. See, see the purpose of the old covenant was twofold. One, to expose transgressions and sins and trespasses. The law has done that. That's not hard to prove, right? We have, we have tons of laws on the books in our culture, in our community, in our country. There are tons of laws on the books. Those laws expose us as guilty, if we're guilty of them. Right? Well, well, the law of God exposes us as guilty before the Lord. Another purpose of the law is to provide justice for lawbreakers, so, so the Old Testament has done this perfectly. Every person has been found guilty of, of some sin and therefore deserves the just retribution of death, which is eternal separation from God. See, see that's what every single one of us deserves. I, I hope we would agree that no sin is a small matter. That, that in the face of a holy God, that, that no sin is a small matter. Yet in our world, sin carries various consequences. If we sin against a family member, there will be some consequences to that, right? There's a, there's a system in each of our families to bring justice when we sin against each other. If we sin against a police officer, the consequences just got a little bit steeper. If we sin against a judge in the court of law, the consequences grow steeper and deeper still. If we sin against a world ruler, if we sin against the president, then the consequences may be the greatest. See, the law of God has exposed every one of us as sinners against the incomparably holy and majestic God of the universe. Like, like we have sinned against he who is the highest. 
the highest rank. And therefore, the penalty, the consequences of our sin, God says, is eternal death, separation from him forever. That is the old covenant. The old covenant has proven reliable. So so here's the question. How will we escape if we neglect the grace of the new covenant? If the old covenant has proven reliable, how will we escape if we neglect grace? So what are we in danger of not escaping? See, see here's where I, in, in my study, I'm asking my Bible, okay, what, what is it that we're in danger of not escaping? Are, are we in danger here of losing our salvation? Is one of the questions, right? And, and friends, again, I, I'm just gonna say there is insurmountable internal evidence in Hebrews that this letter was written to believers, Of course, if the unbeliever rejects the New Testament of grace and dies in that rejection, they will be damned for eternity. The Bible teaches us that. The issue here in verse 3 is that the text does not use the word reject. It uses the word neglect. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. These, these believers were not in danger of rejecting the gospel. They were in danger of neglecting the gospel. So, so what danger does a negligence towards the gospel bring to the believer? The answer is not the loss of salvation. That cannot be true. You, you compare scripture with scripture and, and there are an overwhelming number of passages that teach the security of the believer in Jesus Christ. So so the answer cannot be the loss of their salvation. I would just say first that negligence is not a small matter. Sometimes sometimes I think maybe I'm inclined, maybe we're inclined to think that that to neglect neglect the gospel is kind of a small matter. Well, Well, I got my ticket to heaven. I'm good. I'm good. I'm going there, so it doesn't matter how I, see, that's the accusation against, against those of us who believe in eternal security. The accusation is, oh, you Baptists, you, you, you people who think you, you're, gonna, you're once saved, always saved, right? You think you can just sin your way into heaven. No, that's not. That's not what the scriptures teach. The scriptures categorically teach just the opposite. That, that at new birth, at, at the spiritual birth, there is a regeneration of the soul that takes place by which God instills within the heart new desires, desires to please him, desires to love him. And so now we, we live out of love, not legalistic duty. Right? That's the gospel. So, so, so once saved, always saved is not a doctrine that teaches, oh, well, you can just send your way to heaven. You can live any way you want. No. That is categorically not what the scriptures teach. So, so then, negl- if negligence is not a small matter, what are we in danger of neglecting here? It, it's not the danger of losing salvation, but it's, it's the chastening of the Lord. And I hope that over our study, over the course of our study of Hebrews, this will become clearer to you. Neglecting the gospel leads to the discipline of the Lord in our lives. That, that, that the discipline of the Lord which comes to the believer when, when we neglect the grace that has been given to us and treat it casually and trample upon it through our negligence, we are going to receive the chastening of the Lord. What does Hebrews 12 teach us? The Lord disciplines those whom he loves. So you gotta go all the way clear to the end of this letter to, to, to really start to see the, what, what these warning passages are teaching us that the believer is in danger of the chastening hand of God. Friends, casual Christianity is a weak witness of our great and incomparable and superior Savior. Casual Christianity is a black eye on the Savior. And it is commonplace in our church culture. Like casual, a casual nature, a casual approach to our salvation, a casual approach about the community of Christ, a casual approach about the word of God, a casual approach concerning prayer. See, that's, that's what was marking these, the original readers of this letter. And I'm just saying to us that that speaks to us today. 
Like, like the Hebrew Christians then, too many Christians now are content to wade in the shallow end of the spiritual pool. I'm just going to stay down here in this end where it's like three feet of water. I'm comfortable here. I'm going to stay right here in, in the elementary things. No, no, no. Learn how to swim. Right? That's the admonition. That's the exhortation. Learn how to swim. Learn how to go into the deep end. Grow forward in reliance in your faith upon Jesus Christ. Build on the elementary doctrines of your faith. Bring forth fruit that is, that is glory, glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't neglect the grace that has been given to you because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. All right, here's the third point, the relevance. Here's the relevance of the exhortation. Who gave witness to the old covenant? So verses 3b and 4. So after he asked this question, he says of the old covenant, it was declared. The law was, or excuse me, this is of the new covenant. It was declared at first by the Lord. And it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. That, those, are the, those are the witnesses of the new covenant. But who, who gave testimony of the old covenant? Angels. That's the argument, right, in these first two chapters. Angels, chapter 1 and 2, angels gave witness. Now, now where is he going in chapter 3 and 4? Moses and the generation of Moses. They gave witness to the Old Covenant. So, so you follow this outline that, that the writer of Hebrews is going to prove Jesus is superior to the angels. Jesus is superior to Moses and the Kadesh Barnea generation that, that Moses led in the wilderness and died in the wilderness. And then he's going to turn his attention towards the, the Levitical priesthood, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And, and so he's going to prove that, that Jesus is a superior high priest than, than that of the Levit Levitical priesthood. So, so these three witnesses, the angels, Moses, and the, the Levites, all gave witness to the, old to the old covenant, the law. And the writer of Hebrews is going to systematically break down, this is why Jesus is greater. This is why Jesus is better. Now, now the argument here in verses 3 and 4 is this. He, he says here, he, he answers the question, who gave witness to the new covenant? Right? Well, the Lord Jesus did. The Lord Jesus, the superior revelator. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Christ has made the Father known. Now, the apostles and other firsthand witnesses, right? He says, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. Now, now here, here's, some internal, here's some internal evidence that it wasn't one of the apostles that wrote Hebrews. It's the word us, right? It was attested to us by those who heard. So, so it would seem that, that quite possibly the writer of Hebrews was not one of these firsthand witnesses, the apostles, an apostle, so, so he says it was attested to us by the apostles, those who heard, those who were the firsthand witnesses, and then it was attested to by God the Father through the Holy Spirit. So, so look, at the, look at the witness of the new covenant versus the witness of the old covenant. Who gave witness to the old co covenant? Angels, Moses, the Levitical priests. Who gives witness to the new covenant, the new covenant of grace? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and the apostles. Right? So, so here you see a superior covenant because of a superior witness. The, the relevance and the superiority of the covenant of grace and the gospel is seen in the superiority of the witnesses who gave testimony to it. If the law attested to by angels, Moses and the Levites, was proven reliable, then how much more reliable is grace, which is attested to by Jesus, the apostles, and God the Father and God the Spirit. That's the argument. So what does it mean to us? 
What's at stake in our salvation? What's at stake in our salvation, friends? How we stand in this generation. How we stand, how you and I stand in this present darkness. How do we live out Christ in this generation? Wherever there may be slack in our faith, places where we might be drifting away, our thought life, the motivations of our heart, our love for Jesus, our priorities, our lack of time in the word of God, our lack of prayer, or just drifting away from real and meaningful Christian community. Whatever and wherever that slack exists, oh, we've got to ask the Lord to examine our hearts. God, help us to pull the rope tighter. Pull us closer to you. Tighten the slack. Let there be no slack between us and the Lord. How we stand in this present darkness is at stake. Secondly, how Christ is represented by us in this present world. His glory is at stake. Can I just suggest to you that the darker the culture grows around us, the brighter the light of the gospel can shine through us as believers? The darker the days grow, the brighter the light shines? Right, so let's shine. And then finally, what reward will we receive and have available to lay back at the feet of Christ at the judgment seat. Friends, please don't think it a light thing to be present in the face of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. To stand before Jesus who who gave his all on the cross for us and and to stand there empty-handed having nothing or very little fruit for his glory because we neglected the salvation that he graced to us. I'm telling you, that is going to be a tragic day for some. We're all gonna suffer some loss there, no doubt, right? None of us gets it perfect. It's gonna be a tragedy to stand before Christ who gave his all for us and to only have a little to give back to him. You ask, but pastor, won't I be saved? Yeah. Yeah, if you know the Lord, you'll be saved. You'll be saved, but what a tragedy that you, will be, you have forfeited the eternal joy and the eternal treasures that go with it in rewards because we were complacent or we were apathetic. We did not pay close attention to our salvation. So, so the text challenges us in this way. We can be lazy. We can be lazy and suffer loss. Or by God's grace and in his power, we can do the work and gain the reward. And on that day, give glory to Jesus Christ. See, see, we're all gonna answer a question this morning. We're gonna answer a couple questions. Do Do you know the Lord? Right, that's the primary question. Do you know the Lord? Have you put your faith and trust in Christ Jesus? Have you turned from your sin, confessed to him? and confessed him as your savior, believed in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Do you know the Lord? The other question is for those of us who do believe. See, see what, kind of, what kind of life will we live? Will we live with slack in the rope, drifting off into dangerous territory? Or will we live by the grace of God, listen, not by our own works, but, but we do have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to position ourselves to grow forward in the Lord. These believers, they had a responsibility to position themselves under the submission of, in submission to the Spirit of God, in the submission to the the Lord, and to grow forward. Are you positioning yourself every day? Am I positioning myself every day in the Word, praying, depending on the Lord, leaning upon Him, asking God, search my heart and know me, walking in humility, right, living by the power of Christ. Father, I pray that you would help us. This morning, I pray that you would know our hearts. Each one here, Father, know first and foremost, God, whether we are in the faith. Father, it's not my, certainly not my inclination to cast doubt on a genuine believer's salvation. Lord, you know each one of our hearts. Help us, God. You discern our hearts. And so, Father, in these moments of invitation, will you discern our hearts? If there's anyone here who does not know Christ as their Savior, God, would you 
Would you turn their heart to you? Would you help them to make that turn? To come in humility, prayerfully confessing their sin before you, prayerfully confessing that the law has done its job. They, they have been found guilty under the law. But God, as they come, may they receive grace. Grace for the forgiveness of their sins so that you would save them and forgive them and set within them new desires to love you, to pursue you. But Father, will you help us as believers? God, we want to represent you well. Father, will you search us and know us? God, we, we still struggle with besetting sin. I do. Father, we help us. Help us to know our heart. We need your Spirit's help to discern our hearts. And so, God, we want to be right with you. We want to be right with each other. And so we pray that you would help us in this. And may you get the glory for all of it. We can't do it without you, Lord. We wouldn't do it without you. And so, Father, thank you for your, uh, for your grace that works in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.